my, my subject tonight is Chief Anderson. And that's kind of a mystery to a lot of people. There's not much about him. You won't find a book about his life. Uh, you'll find very little about him. Uh, I searched for years to pull together everything that I have that I'm going to present to you tonight. It's not everything. I'm going to take him from birth up to when uh, they exited Anderson, and then I will describe to you what the Indian village, what we know about that here. Uh, I won't take him the rest of his life, uh, otherwise Melinda would be fixing breakfast for us tomorrow morning, so we're not going to do that. I titled this The Life and Times of Chief William Anderson. His existence as a Delaware Indian tribal leader first became known at one of the more important treaty signings in the old Northwest Territory. On the third day of August in the year 1795, a treaty was concluded between the United States government, represented by General Anthony Wayne, and 12 Indian tribes at Greenville, Ohio, and it became known as the Treaty of Greenville. The United States forces under uh, General Wayne had dealt a crushing defeat to the Confederation of Indians at the Battle of Fallen Timbers the year before, 1794, bringing to an end the Indian menace in Western Ohio. The Indians in Western Ohio had begun to resist the settlement that was taking place in that state, or it wasn't a state yet, the territory, but it was soon to become a state. And there was great resistance. In fact, um, there is one, uh, one fight over there that took place between the Native Americans and the United States Army, and it was the worst, the worst defeat for the United States Army in all of its history. Over 90% of the soldiers were killed. So the Indian resistance was quite strong. Coming back from that, though, was the Battle of Fallen Timbers in 1794, and the fortunes of that were reversed. Uh, the vanquished tribes that signed the treaty were the Wyandotte, the Shawnee, the Ottawa, Chippewa, Potawatomi, Miami, Eel River, Wee, Kickapoo, Piankashaw, Kaskaskia, and the Delaware. And this is the Treaty of Greenville painting that hangs in the uh, State House in Columbus, Ohio a huge painting, and it represents that treaty signing. And basically what happened, what the treaty was, was the Native Americans who lived in Western Ohio relinquished their claims to the lands in Western Ohio, and then they were to move westward into the dark and foreboding land called Indiana. And they knew not what they were getting into coming into Indiana, Quite a famous setting here. Um, this is General Anthony Wayne. Uh, Lewis and Clark were there. The Indians were represented by the chief of the Miami tribe, Little Turtle. And there's one Delaware in this photograph that, we, that the artist identified for us. And that's this man right here. And his name was Bacongahelis. And his village ended up being over southeast of Muncie. He was the war chief of the Delaware. The, the Delaware had chiefs for, in, in peacetime, and they had chiefs in wartime. And whichever they were encounter, in, involved in, that chief was in charge of what went on. And they're just coming out of wartime, so Bacongahelis is in charge of the Delaware. Fourteen chiefs and great men represented the Delaware at the signing of the treaty, including Kikthawina, who was better known as Chief William Anderson. Kikthawina translates to creaking boughs in the Delaware language. Don't know why he was given that name, what significance that is, but it had some significance to the people who named him. His mark over his name on the historic Treaty of Greenville is the first time that his name appears in the historical records. His age is not known with absolute certainty. I examined several sources, and I found very conflicting results in doing so. One says he was born sometime during the 1740s. Another report says he was born sometime between 1750 and 1757. An evaluation of his age occurred during the summer of 1817 when a Quaker missionary from New York by the name of Thomas Dean 
visited Chief Anderson in his village on the White River and stayed overnight in his lodge. Dean estimated him to be a man of 60 to 65 years of age. Another evaluation occurred in 1823 when Indian agent John Johnston wrote that the chief was 60 years old. I believe it's safe to assume, based upon the two eyewitnesses, he was probably born sometime in the mid-1750s. And supporting that assumption is the birth years of his children, beginning in the mid to late 1770s and continuing to 1789. The Delaware were divided into three sub-tribes, or as they were also called, clans. You had the Unami, or turtle, and you see them depicted here. This is, this is eastern Pennsylvania, where the Delaware lived before they began to move eastward. The Unami were centralized here. The Unalakto, or turkey, uh, were here, here, down here at the bottom. And then the uh, Mincy, or wolf, clan was there. It's interesting to me that, that in the Delaware language, there were three dialects. So they not, not all spoke the same language, they spoke versions of the same language. And uh, there were dialects. To give you an example, to give you an example, the White River here. The Delaware who lived along the White River here in Anderson called it Wapexapu, Wapexapu, meaning a place where there's much white earth. The Delaware who lived north of Muncie, upriver of Muncie, they were of a different dialect, and they called the river by the same word meaning, but a different pronunciation, Wapahani. And you may know the Wapahani High School that is east of Muncie today takes its name from that dialect version of the same meaning. The animals of turkey, turtle, and wolf uh, were emblematic totems of the separate divisions that bore their names. The Mincy became corrupted into the word Muncie, sometimes called the Christian Indians, and Muncie, Indiana today is a corruption of that. There's agreement on his place of birth. He, it was called Anderson's Ferry. That location today is the town of Marietta, Pennsylvania, which is located on the Susquehanna River. My, my arrow points to Marietta, Pennsylvania, if you're familiar with all with Pennsylvania, here's Lancaster, here's York. This is the Susquehanna River. Anderson's father operated a ferry, operated a ferry that took people back and forth across the Susquehanna River. His mother, whose name is unknown to us, was the daughter of the Delaware tribal chief, Netawatwees. Netawatwees in, in Indian history is a very prominent person. Um, Again, he's Chief Anderson's grandfather, and he had a tremendous influence on him because Netawatwees was a converted, had been converted to Christianity by the Moravian missionaries who lived near the tribe in Pennsylvania. And he exercised a tremendous influence on Chief Anderson. Anderson himself never converted to Christianity that I can find, but his teachings and uh, pr the principles and teachings of Christianity were passed through Netawatwees to Chief Anderson. And in a little while here, you'll see an example of what I'm talking about. His, his mother, her brother was Chief Jelliman, who was also known as Captain William Henry Kilbuck, a name adopted by him during the American Revolution when a Mr. Henry saved his life. No greater honor could an Indian pay to someone who had saved his life than to take his name. And that's what was done here. Um, you'll notice the um, captain. During the Revolutionary War, the American colonists sought the help of the Native Americans to help fight the British. And when one of the Native Americans did outstanding, uh, was outstanding on the battlefield, they would make him captain only in name, not, a, not an official military rank, but the, the Indians liked that. They liked being called captain, and so they would make that part of their name. I have found references, I have found references to Chief Anderson also being called Captain Anderson. 
William Anderson's father, named John, was of Swedish origin and was a traitor. Uh, John Anderson was known to be an honest man and well-loved by the Delaware people. Thus, William Anderson was a half-breed, being a child of an Indian mother and a white father. Little is known about Chief Anderson's early life except that he spent much of his time with Netawatwees, in whose village he was born. It's said that Anderson was greatly influenced by him, as I said earlier, and Netawatwees was the head chief and keeper of the wampum, which is the sacred shell beads that you see here in the picture for the Unami clan of the Delaware. This was, this was how the Delaware kept record of their history. Each of those beads symbolized a part of their history. And it was the chief who memorized it and then passed it on to his successors as to the history of the tribe. And that's how there was no oral, there was no written history, it was an oral history. And that's how the, the history of the tribe was passed down through the passing of the wampum when one chief would succeed another. William Anderson was very young when the tribe moved to the Ohio Territory near Cuyahoga Falls in July 1758 and just a few years later they had to move again. What was going on in Pennsylvania around where I showed you where Marietta was, or where Marietta is today, was the French and Indian War had broken out. And that was a, a transfer of the war that was going on in Europe between England and France known as the Seven Years War. It transferred to the United States as the French and Indian War um, actually lasted nine years here from 1754 to 1763. Netawatwees moved his family away from the fighting which was going on in Pennsylvania to Ohio. That's the reason I believe why they came to Ohio. They first were located here for a short time at Cuyahoga Falls. Uh, this then further south on the Tuscarora River where Netawatwees established what was called Newcomer's Town. The English translation for Netawatwees was newcomers. The Delaware called the village, and there's the first word I'm not going to try to pronounce. Early European American traders and settlers named the village Newcomer's Town after the chief. Earlier, Chief Netawatwees had sent John Anderson to reside among the Delaware in Ohio to read and translate for them. John had a trading post at Newcomer's Town, although he was not home much, as according to what I can find. The government often called upon John uh, to go on some errand as an interpreter or to carry message to Indians. So he, he kind of worked for the government and he worked for the Indians back and forth and he was trusted by both sides. William Anderson was almost a grown man when his grandfather, Natawatwees, passed away in October of 1776. It's not known when or where Anderson's parents died. There's no record of that. Delaware tradition says that William Anderson was made chief of the Turkey clan sometime before 1795 while residing on the Tuscarora River. Now, if you went to Ohio today and you tried to find the Tuscarora River, you wouldn't find it. It's been renamed. It's called the Muskegon River in Ohio. Anderson would have been about 30 years of age when he, he took this uh, role as the clan chief of the Turkey clan. He's not tribal chief. He's a clan chief. Before Anderson was 20 years old, he took a Delaware maiden from the Wolf Clan for his wife. She was a relative of Captain Pipe and had at least two sons from a previous marriage. Now, Captain Pipe is known as Hopicon in Delaware history and uh, quite famous. Many think that Pipe Creek here in Madison County is named for Captain Pipe. I've not been able to substantiate that. There are those who thought Captain Pipe had a village uh, up south of Arrestus on Pipe Creek. Not been able to substantiate that. The Delaware Society is a matrilineal society, meaning that the children of the, mar of the mother are aligned with the mother's clan and automatically part of a larger group. It also means that all of the children of a certain woman are full brothers and sisters, regardless of who their father is. That's different than our society, isn't it? In our society, we have children and we have stepchildren. In the Delaware society, there is no such thing as stepchildren. They are all full children. The eldest son was named Swanick. The name is spelled several different ways, which is the case with, with many Native American names. 
He was born around 1776 on the Tuscarora River in Ohio. Her other son was named Pushies, meaning the cat. And he was born a few years after his brother. Remember the name Pushies. It will come into play later on in our story. During this time, the American colonies were engaged in the struggle for their independence from England. The Delaware allegiance was split between support for the colonists and the British. William Anderson's loyalties were with Chief White Eyes, who was pro-American, while Captain Pipe supported the British. So within the Delaware tribe, there were factions that supported the British and factions that supported the American colonists during our Revolutionary War. This disagreement caused Captain Pipe to split with the main Delaware tribe and move farther west into Ohio. He ended up near Sandusky, Ohio, and in fact there's a, a great statue in Sandusky, Ohio to Hopicon or Captain Pipe. He took most of his clan and warriors with him, openly opposing the Americans. Also going with him were his family members, which included the wife of William Anderson and her sons Swanick and Pussies. Captain Pipe's daughter married to Chief Anderson. When Captain Pipe moved to, Sand to near Sandusky, she went with him, and as did her children. Her loyalty was to her father, not to her husband. She died during the, what was known as the severe winter of 1796. By now, Swanick uh, was a grown warrior and became a minor chief of the Wolf Clan. With the death of their mother, the two sons were reunited with Anderson and stayed with him the rest of his life. During this period, Anderson took another wife. Her name was, there you go. She was reported to be the daughter of Chief White Eyes. This marriage occurred in 1784. She was of the Turtle Clan and had two sons by a previous marriage. The first was, there's another name, a Delaware word meaning one who must be killed twice. And he was born in the late 1770s. Her other son was, who was born in 1780. He was known as Captain Ketch Ketchum, or Jack Ketchum. Remember the name Ketchum. Now you got two names to remember, Pushies and Ketchum. She also had a daughter, won't try that one, or Nancy Ketchum, who was born 1782-1783. Nancy grew up in the Anderson home where other little Andersons were soon added to the family. When Nancy was only about six years old, a new sister called McCungus, that I can pronounce, was born and the two grew up together, always knowing they were sisters, even though they, did, they had different fathers. Again, that's that society, there are no step or half children. There's yet another son called Second Dine. I want you to remember that name as well. Now you got three to remember. Pushies, um, Ketchum, and Second Dine. One source says, uh, that, states that his mother was the second wife of Chief Anderson. Another says there's no knowledge as to who his mother was, which could mean he was adopted. It's thought he was born around 1780. There's no other information about Second Dine's young life. Anderson and his second wife had three more children. These would be his natural children. A son, Sarcoxy, was born in 1784, followed by another son, Sosicum, and then the daughter, Macungus, meaning last born, who was born in 1789. I've often chuckled. How do you know when you have a baby it's going to be the last born? Some people do, some don't. I think she was, she was probably named after a few years, not, born, not named at birth. When mentioning his children in his writings, now I, I need, to, need to clarify that, Anderson was not literate, but he dictated a lot of letters, and other people wrote them down for him. And in one of his letters, he's... He always mentions his children in the same order, presumably the order of their birth. In the contents of four different letters that I've examined, dictated by him, his names his, he names his sons always in the same order. Swanick is first, Pushy's is second, Second Dine is third, and Sir Coxey is fourth. Always. I found the name of another girl mentioned in our county histories here in Madison County. Her name was Onehi, or Dancing Feather. 
Now, several years ago, I'm going to say maybe 10 years ago, uh, the uh, Anderson Town Powwow, which some of you may be familiar with, that occurs over in Athletic Park, um, the Native Americans come back every year for that, as they will this year. Uh, there was a reception held over at the uh, Merchants, now the Merchants uh, Bank Tower, and I attended the reception. And at the reception were some of the current and past tribal chiefs of the Delaware. And so I got uh, pulled him aside and I said, had any of you ever heard of Onehi? And they had not. Now she did not go with Anderson. Uh, I'll explain that here in a, in a moment though, so you'll have a little more information on that. Today the Delaware tribe has no knowledge of her existence. If she was his daughter, she could have been adopted. Um, but in all, he had 10 children, three natural plus seven more. In June of 1805, the second wife of William Anderson became sick and she died. The cause was attributed to a fever. Could have been smallpox. He never married again. Sir Coxey was only 14 years old when his family, along with most of the Delaware tribe, was forced to move to the White River in Indiana. This is interesting. Sir Coxey was literate. Not only could he read and write, he could speak English. I believe that he was a product of the Moravian missionaries that always were with the Delaware wherever they went. They taught him this. And he remembers, and he wrote it down, I've seen it, that he remembers that his, he was born in 1784, and he knows he was 14 years old when his father, Chief Anderson, brought the tribe here which we, that validates and gives us the date of 1798 would be the date that the Delaware arrived in what we know as Anderson, Indiana. This occurred in 1798, three years after the conclusion of the Treaty of Greenfield, in which the Indian tribes in Ohio ceded their land to the government in exchange for land in Indiana. Uh, part of the provisions of the Treaty of Greenville was it, it provided that each of the tribes that signed they were given three years to leave, to get things ready and to leave, and Anderson and the Delaware took all three years before they moved over here. The Delaware struck a bargain with the Miami to settle on some of their territory, and Anderson and his tribe settled in several villages along the White River. You see, after the Treaty of Greenville was signed and they agreed to leave, they had no place to go, and the government had not provided a place for them to go. They just wanted him to go because Ohio was only a few years away from being coming a state. So they wanted the Native Americans out of Ohio. The Miami who were already here, the Miami had been here since we think the early 1750s. They extended an invitation to the Delaware to come and live on the land that they claimed as their own. And part of that land was here along the White River. Chief Anderson selected a site along the left bank of White River, and it was known to the traders, fur traders and so forth that came through this area, they called it Anderson Town. In 1806, Chief William Anderson became the head chief of the Delaware tribe, a position he held until his death. The <coughs> former tribal chief, a man by the name of Ted Paskett, who lived at, uh, well, if you know where the Minatrista Center is at Muncie, uh, that was the site of his village, and he was the tribal chief of all of the Delaware. He resided there. Um, he was killed uh, by his own son, and, to, and that's a long story. I won't go into it, but he was killed by his own son, and so it, it, it became necessary to select a new tribal chief. His elevation occurred after the March 1806 death of Tedapaskett. Anderson's son, Sir Coxey, had developed strong legs and was fleet of foot. So he was chosen to run all, to all of the outlying villages to call the people together to Anderson Town to help choose the new head chief. After the wise shaman had all spoken, the council made their choice and Chief Anderson was selected. He held that position for the next 25 years. And as far as I can tell in my research of Delaware, Indian history, he is the longest presiding tribal chief at 25 years. During the War of 1812, Chief Anderson was asked to leave the White River 
at the request of General William Henry Harrison, the territorial governor of Indiana, who recognized the peaceful nature of the Delaware. There's a story behind that. You see, in early in 1811, a Shawnee, a Shawnee Indian, arrived here, met with Anderson in the council house or longhouse, which it was located where St. Mary's Church is today, just a short distance from here. The Shawnee met with Chief Anderson and wanted him to become part of a confederation of Indians that, were he, that the Shawnee was putting together to help drive the white man out of Indiana, out of Ohio, basically throwing back in the Atlantic Ocean. That's what he wanted to do. That Shawnee's name? Tecumseh. Tecumseh. Anderson said to Tecumseh, we are a peaceful tribe. I will not commit my warriors to that confederation. That confederation, if you know your Indiana history, was blown up at the Battle of Tippecanoe in November 7th of 1811, east of Lafayette, Indiana. Tecumseh's brother, the prophet, was the one who led the Indian Confederation. Tecumseh was not there at that fight. There were a few Delaware with the, with the Indians that were there, but they were not the main Delaware from this tribe here. Anderson had kept them out. Fast forward the next year, and the United States is involved in the War of 1812 with England. And north of here, on the Mississippi River, west of Marion, there's a fight brewing between the Native Americans who backed the British and the Americans. And the Native American tribe up there, the Miami, sent runners down the old trail that connected the Mississippi Wall and White River. Today, in our county, it's County Road 300 West, goes right through the center of Arrestus, Indiana. They sent runners from the Mississippi Wall here to the White River, requesting that Chief Anderson send his warriors up there to fight with the other Indians to overthrow the Americans. Anderson said, I'm not going to do that. We are peaceful. We are not going to commit our, I'm not going to commit my uh, braves to that fight. And so they didn't. Well, that was rewarded by General William Henry Harrison. He recognized the fact that Chief Anderson had kept his warriors out of two big fights here in Indiana. The army was in the process of purging the troublesome Indians from central Indiana, led by the Shawnee Indian, the prophet, and did not want to involve the Delaware. So Anderson sent a communi or, uh, Harrison sent a communication to Chief Anderson, and he said, I want you to pack up your tribe, and move to a reservation that I have set aside for you at Piqua, Ohio, and stay there until I tell you it's safe to come home. So Anderson gathered up around 2,000 and led them up to Piqua, Ohio, along the Auglaize River, and there they stayed from early 1812, 1813, until the War of 1812 ended in 1815, and then they came back. The prophet's brother uh, Tecumseh, I told you that, had visited the uh, Anderson town requesting the chief's help in fighting the Americans. Anderson refused his quest and kept the Delaware out of the fight. In 1813, Anderson and his tribe moved to near Pickway, Ohio. Here, Anderson and approximately 2,000 Delaware remained until the end of the war. He did not return to Anderson town until after the War of 1812 ended in 1814. By the Treaty of St. Mary's, on the third day of October, 1818, between the Delaware and the United States, the former ceded all their claims to lands in the states of Ohio and Indiana under a perpetual annuity from the latter of $4,000 to provide them with comfortable homes beyond the Mississippi. In this treaty, the Delaware reserved the right to occupy their land in Indiana for a period of three years, similar to the same provisions that were in the Treaty of Greenville. The government promised to pay the Delaware for their improvements and furnish 120 horses, some boats, and provisions for the move. The key thing to them, though, was the money. The tribe was to receive $4,000 every year payable in silver. 
And the chief had to go to Fort Wayne, to the fort, to receive his $4,000 in silver to bring back to be used to provide provisions for his tribe. They were also going to receive 120 horses to move. The horse meant nothing to them. This was a heavily forested area. A horse is useless, but he would become very valuable to the Delaware where they were going. The chief did not want to cede away their land, but the government enticed him to, to, uh, to their side by secretly promising him a life annuity of $360, a bribe, a bribe. A supplement to the treaty read, quote, by private and confidential agreement between the parties, it stipulated that Captain Swanick, Pushy, Secondine, and Sir Coxey shall each receive from the government a life annuity of $100. The agreement was approved by George Vashing, the U.S. agent. Thus, Chief Anderson secured for his sons an annual payment from the government in the amount of $100 to his own. So every year, his sons got $100 from the government, and he got $360, and the tribe got $4,000 every year. However, Sir Coxey was the first to receive the annuity, and he did not receive it until June of 1863. And this was agreed upon in 1818. Anderson was unaware that not only was Congress easier, eager to approve any transaction that would result in moving the Indians farther west, but also that to please their constituents, congressmen were putting pressure on the Commissioner of Indian Affairs to make haste in placing the Indians beyond the Mississippi. Anderson dispatched a letter to Congress, quote, to send me a paper that will give us a sure title to the land to which we are going so that the white people may no more disturb us." Close quote. The chief's concern about having a deed for the lands west of the Mississippi was premature. For at this time, the government didn't know exactly where they were going to put the Delaware. Knowledge of that territory beyond the Mississippi was still incomplete, despite the report of Lewis and Clark and the United States government was apprehensive about possibly bringing on more Indian troubles by placing the Eastern Indians on land claimed by the Western tribes. This is exactly what was destined to happen for as the Delaware were pushed westward, they ran into conflict with their Indian brethren, the Pawnee and Osage, which added to their sorrows. Chief Anderson and the Delaware did not leave here until September the 20th, 1821, almost three years uh, granted to them. I took this photograph standing on the John F. Kennedy Bridge of Character. You all may know it as the Blue Bridge that connects Park Place with Anderson. I'm standing on that bridge because the Delaware left right here. They left on September the 20th, 1821, and I took this picture on September the 20th, 2008. We do things like that just to show you what, it would, what possibly it would have looked like tree-wise and so forth. In late August and early September, the Delaware Indian began to collecting preparatory to their departure to the new home in western Missouri. The old chief felt bitterly about the St. Mary's Treaty, which had deprived them of their lands on which the Delaware had lived since about 1795. The Indians were forlorn, dejected company, weakened by disease, drunkenness, and poorly fed and clothed. The scene at Andersontown has been described by a few who witnessed it. We're very fortunate because a number of settlers who were already moving in wrote down what they saw that day, and we have record of it. They said that 50 canoes floated on the river, right here, while herds of ponies and pack horses bearing the camp equipage of the tribe stood ready for the journey. They said that the young braves and squaws were to go overland while the aged members of the tribe were to travel by water. The white uh, residents turned out to witness their departure. Chief Anderson was the last to move, according to witnesses. Onehi, Anderson's daughter mentioned earlier, had decided to remain at the settlement with her husband. She married a white man by the name of Charles Stanley. I got curious. What happened to her? I found the Stanleys in the 1830 census living in Richmond. 
In the 1840 census, I find no record of them. I do not know what happened to them, but they were in Richmond, Indiana in the census of 1830. When all was in readiness, the chief laid his hand on the head of his daughter. Again, this is description from the settlers who witnessed it. A hush fell upon the assembled multitude as he spoke in the expressive and figurative language of the Delaware, our father's parting blessing and benediction. That's straight out of our history books. The eagle feather in his plume quivered slightly, but beyond this there was no outward sign of deep feeling that stirred the bosom of the noble chief. This simple ceremony over, he stepped into the canoe, stood erect, while the fleet, responsive to the strokes of paddles, shot out into the river, out into the current, and thus the long and tedious journey to the new hunting grounds was commenced. They had no idea where they were going. No idea. If you can, next time you cross the Eisenhower Bridge and you look down there, let your mind's eye put 50 canoes in the river full of Indians and equipment. The people on the riverbank stood silently, they said, watching the departing canoes until the bend in the river hid them from view. Many of them waved. There was a really good relationship between the Delaware who lived here and the settlers, a really good relationship. No hostilities had occurred, a good relationship. Many waved and the Indians waved back, they said. Those who were traveling by land would have followed the old Indian road leading from Anderson Town. One of the old settlers, John Allen, recalled in his later years seeing 20 canoe loads leaving one particular point, and this was the last of the fleet of canoes in Madison County. A little description for you of this place where we live. The Delaware called it Wapamensink, which means chestnut tree place. The reason for that is that this whole area in downtown Anderson was filled with chestnut trees. Chestnut trees were everywhere. A blight in the 1920s, similar to the Dutch elm disease that some of you may remember in the 1940s and 50s that killed the Dutch elm, a blight killed the chestnut trees here in the, in the 1920s. But before that, this area was filled with chestnut trees. And so the Delaware had the word Wapamensink, which means chestnut tree place. That's what they gave, that's what they called this site. It was located on the left bank of White River on the present side of Anderson. The town originally contained only 15 or so families. It was very small. It was his clan. Remember, he's a clan chief, not a tribal chief. So he brings his clan with him. So it's a small number of Native Americans living here. In 1818, it was estimated there were about 800 Delaware Indians living in this area, and about half of them lived in Anderson's town. About 1819 or 1820, a few pioneers arrived here, and they found quite a remnant of the tribe living there. Some said as many as 1,000 lived here. After the Delaware departed, the settlers called their new home Anderson Town. I've taken this Google Earth shot to show you that the, the Indian village basically went from the Madison, what is the Madison County Jail down here to St. Mary's Church. This side of the river over to about where the courthouse is. An area of about roughly 30 acres, I think, something like that. You need to understand what Anderson looked like. <clears throat> this is the earliest depiction of our city done in 1871, would have been 50 years after the Delaware left. And it's populated as you can see, but what I wanted you to see was these bluffs that were along White River. The village was along the top of the bluffs and then some was down along the riverside. Those bluffs were all removed years and years and years ago when we created Central Avenue and we graded everything down, but there was a sharp drop. It was 76 feet from here to the river and the Indians lived on top of the bluff of the river. 
At its largest size, the village was spread over an area that today would include St. Mary's Church on the south side to the Madison County Jail on the north. I'm standing in the parking lot next to St. Mary's Church and I'm looking across this area to the Madison County Jail. And this, remember, the ground was the same height that the jail was on and the church was on as a bluff all the way across here. Now it's all been graded down. The river was uh, its eastern boundary with possibly some habitation on the east side of the river. They would have been elevated because as some of you know, if you've lived here any length of time, you know the White River before we had a levee uh, along the river. Park Place would flood every spring uh, out up to a certain point beyond um, uh, College Avenue, then, the, then 8th, 8th Street or the Park Place begins to rise. So the, the village would have been in that area. They would not have been down where they flooded. <clears throat> its western boundary would have included the area where the Madison County Courthouse now stands. Uh, altogether, this area encompassed approximately 30 acres. Located at or near St. Mary's Church was the Longhouse. This is an interesting place because it was the only structure of its kind in the village. It had, uh, there were always, I'm to, I, I've read, always open fires going, burning inside. There were openings in the roof where the smoke could go out. It was a place where guests and so forth and important people who came to visit with Chief Anderson or just to visit the village, they were taken there. There was always food. There was a place to lie down and sleep. Uh, it was a place of welcoming, what, call it a welcome center, I guess you want to. But the, and all important decisions were also made in the Longhouse. It was used for council meetings and social gatherings. John, record, John Connor recorded uh, visiting the one in Kick the Weena's village. Funny story, or he thought it was funny. John Connor was the brother to William Connor. William Connor is Connor Perry. Okay. Two brothers, John and William Connor. John Connor, they were both very familiar with through the Delaware, but John Connor one time showed up here at Chief Anderson's village dressed as an Indian. And he walked into the council house, and there was a meeting going on, and he just sat down. Well, they just thought he was another one of them. And finally, somebody recognized that that was John Connor, and they all had a good laugh out of it. And he took his trappings off and... Uh, Joined the, uh, joined the fun. We know that the Indians maintained a large village in the rich bottomlands, later known as the Hazlitt Farm, which was the area on the south side of the river between what is today Madison Avenue and Broadway. This is the city of Anderson. This is the bridge that would be the Truman Bridge that crosses the river. The, this is all flat land, and it was along here all the way out to Madison Avenue where the Indians planted their corn. The village <clears throat> was important to, the, to the, the Delaware who lived here for several reasons. Whenever they selected a village site, it had to satisfy three criteria. First was it had to be high enough that you could see an approaching enemy. Number two, you had to have fresh water available, which it did. And thirdly, you had to have fertile fields in order to plant their crops, which had had that. But it also had a fourth advantage, which I'll point out to you in just a moment. The area was approximately a half mile in length and a half mile wide, that is the planting fields. The land was cultivated for a number of years by Indian squaws and was planted in corn. The men never ever tended the garden, never. That was the, the duty of the Indian women, to plant, to cultivate, and to uh, harvest the, the crop. The men hunted. After the Delaware left, <coughs> Colonel Nineveh Berry recalled the appearance of the site. Now, I need to tell you who Nineveh Berry was. Nineveh's parents were John and Sally Berry. And John Berry was the Indian agent that was assigned to come here and live among the Delaware at, just before they moved. His role was to be a facilitator to assist in moving the Delaware out of this area. So they, they ended up living in Chief Anderson's house. But Nineveh Berry, their son, continued to live here and was quite prominent in Anderson's history, clear up to the 1860s. 
He says there was only one road running east and west and a few Indian trails running north and south. There were a few unoccupied Indian cabins and the Indian graveyard with numerous wooded crosses over the graves extending along the bluff of the river. The Delaware lived in two different kinds of housing. One was wigwams, which was a thatched home of, uh, made of uh, uh, boughs of trees and, and bark and so forth. The other was they would build a log cabin, much like what we're used to, uh, what we know as a log cabin. They would build those and live, live there. Once they decided they were going to stay someplace for a length of time, that's when the log cabins went up. The graveyard that he described had wooden, wooden crosses. Not the Christian cross, but a cross like this. And in the Indian tradition, when that cross decays and crumbles and falls to the ground, the spirit is released. That's their belief. The Indian burial ground was located on the ground now occupied by Anderson City Hall and extended as far north as the Martin Grunewald home and to the east bluff overlooking the river. Colonel Nineveh Beria was, uh, once lived in the house which was occupied by Chief Anderson, September 1821. That is Nineveh Berry. Berry first arrived in the area in March of 1821 at the age of 17, and he knew it was Anderson's Lodge, thus establish, establishing that location for us. It was his mother and father, John and Sally, who donated the site in 1827 to Madison County for the purpose of establishing Anderson Town as the county seat. Chief Anderson's Lodge was located at what is today the southeast corner of 8th Street and Central Avenue, immediately south of where the Madison County Jail now stands. One account says his residence was a two-story double cabin, one side of which was occupied by him and his family, and the other by his son, I assume the oldest son, Zarkoxy, lived in that side. This is an old photograph taken of the number one fire station in Anderson. You can tell by the fire apparatus that it's quite old. But do you see this house? That is a clapboard house. You take the clapboard off and it had logs. That's where Chief Anderson lived. It was a single story, but it was on a hillside. So there was a, a walkout on the bottom of it. And there was a fresh spring of water flowing there. Today, that site looks like this. It's all been torn up. When they put in the first Eisenhower Bridge in 1969, uh, that was all leveled. Survey field notes mention a road intersecting the east line of Section 13, which is immediately south of the town site, and 62 chains, which is approximately four-fifths of a mile north of the southeast section corner. Today, Cincinnati Avenue closely follows what I term is the West Fork of the Connor Trail as it entered Anderson's town. And the East Fork came across the river here. This is the old 10th Street Bridge at Edgewater Park, and the East Fork of that trail came in here. I told you there were three things that were important to this site, it was elevation, fresh water, and planting fields. The fourth thing that made this such an important choice for Chief Anderson was this trail. The Connor Trail began at John Connor's Trading Post southeast of Brookville. It ran north through Connorsville and then followed a northerly direction passing Newcastle to the east where it split into two forks. The West Fork turned slightly northwest until it reached Anderson Town. Here it joined what was called the Indian Road or what I term the East Fork of Connor Trail. And this is where they joined. The East Fork came here, the, the uh, West Fork here. To explain this to you, show you a little bit better, John Connor's trading post was south of Brookville, Indiana, and there was a trail that was established. A little north of Newcastle, that trail split. One route went by Bacongahela's town, Tedapaskett's town, and came back into Anderson town where the 10th Street Bridge used to cross the river right over here. The other section of it, the, the other fork, came directly into Anderson's town. That's on Cincinnati Avenue. 
and they joined here and then they went west out what we know as 8th Street Road and followed the river all the way down to William Connor's trading post. So here's one brother, John Connor. Here's the other brother, William Connor. It was a trading route. It was the first route of its kind. Call it I-69 of those days. And it passed right through Anderson Town. So, John, so, so Chief Anderson was pretty wise in putting his village right on that trail because everybody coming and going had to pass through his village. The Connor Trail entered Anderson Town on the southeast side, up here by the, uh, uh, there's Comcast, came in this way. Uh, the trail exited the village by today's 8th Street and continued west to Strawtown, where it turned south, following the White River to William Connor's trading post. Today, West 8th Street Road roughly follows that same route. Our story ends at this point. What I can tell you is that that Chief Anderson and, the, uh, and his tribe ventured down the White River as far as they could go, uh, but first stopping at William Connor's trading post where his daughter, who was married to William Connor McCungus and had six children by William Connor, she decided to go not with her husband, but to go with her father. We've seen that before, haven't we? And so she went with her father west. And that was the last time that William Connor ever saw his wife or his six children. They went on down White River all the way to where it flows into the Wabash. There they trekked, crossed southern Illinois to Fort Kaskaskia. Uh, which is on the Mississippi River of the west side of Illinois. Uh, there they waited until a ferry could take them across a swollen, a swollen Mississippi River. Uh, they transported uh, all of the Indians and horses on one ferry, many, many trips. Uh, they finally, in November, they uh, ended up in southeast Missouri, spent a couple years there. Hunting was not very good, so they moved to southwest Missouri. There his son Sarcoxy settled, and there is a town just east of Joplin, Missouri today called Sarcoxy. And that's where Sarcoxy helped plant that town. Stayed there a few years. Hunting was not good. They petitioned the United States government to let them move again. This time they moved up to Wyandotte County, Kansas, which is the uh, Kansas, the town of city of Kansas City, Kansas, is the uh, county seat of Wyandotte County. And there the chief stayed. He went up there in 1830. And in the fall of 1831, Chief Anderson dies. And he's buried there. His place of burial is not marked. Um, word of his death was not made public for over a month as the Delaware all mourned um, privately and did not want his death to be made, uh, made public. And his place of burial is it was a secret to them. Today, the Delaware who live today have no idea where he's buried other than he's buried there in Wyandotte County, Kansas. That's what he looked like. Or at least I found that image of him in a book and the caption underneath it, I don't have it here, but the caption underneath it said, Chief William Anderson, Delaware. This picture was taken in the Anderson High School gym in 2004. These three men are all three great grandsons of Chief Anderson, two of their wives. This is Michael Pace and his wife, Ella, Michael Pace, if you ever go to Connor Prairie, Michael Pace works over there during the, the um, spring, summer, and fall and interprets Delaware history and, and Delaware uh, customs for the visitors to Connor Prairie. Do you remember Secondine? That was one of the names I asked you to remember. This is Don Secondine. Don Secondine. And do you remember, I asked you to remember the name Ketchum? This is D, D-E-E, 
Ketchum and his wife Annette. And they live in Bartlesville, Oklahoma, which is now where the tribe is located. I'll conclude with a funny story. One Sunday evening, <clears throat> about 10.30, phone rings at my house. I pick it, I'm already in bed, and I pick up the phone, and the man says, right off the bat, I'm sorry, I called you, I didn't realize you're in a different time zone, I apologize. And I said, I said it's all right, who are you and what can I do for you? Well, he says, my name is uh, Curtis Anderson, and he said, I, am, uh, I have a question for you. He said, I'm related to Chief Anderson. And he said, uh, your name was given to me by the Delaware here in Bartersville, Oklahoma, who consider you the authority on Chief Anderson. And I said, well, how can I help you? And he says, my grandmother always told me that I was not a blood relation to Chief Anderson, but yet a step relationship to Chief Anderson. Is that true? I said, well, that all depends upon who your great-great-grandfather is, because his great-great-great-grandfather is Chief Anderson, so it would be one of Chief Anderson's son. I said, who, who, would, who of Chief Anderson's sons are you related to? He says, I descend from the third name I ask you to remember, Pushies. And I said, well, sir, I said, if you are a descendant of Pushies, then I said, in our culture, in our culture, you are a stepchild. But in your culture, you're a full, you are a full son of Chief Anderson. And you could tell the relief in his voice. We talked for probably an hour and a half. I, he was just so happy to get this news. And he said, you know, I've never been to Anderson, Indiana. He says, we consider that our home. I said, I know you do. You come back here for the powwow every year. But he said, we consider it our home. He says, I'd love to visit and see Anderson. If I come, could you take me around and show me the town and where Chief Anderson lived? And I said, yes, be glad to. He says, there's one place that I want to go first. One place that I want to go first. Well, I'm trying to think real quickly. Is he talking about where he lived or what, where's he wanting to go? I said, what is that? He said, I want to go to the wigwam. The wigwam. Yes, he says, I want to see the wigwam. We've heard about the wigwam out here in Bartlesville, and I want to see the wigwam. And I said, well, you know it has no connection to Chief Anderson. That's all right. I want to see the wigwam. I said, you, I, so I told him, I said, you come. I said, it's closed now, but I said, I can make arrangements, and I can get you in if you want to see it. So, this is him. That's me. That's in, outside my office over here at the Museum of Madison County History. The date is August the 28th, 2015. Coincidentally, it is, happens to be the exact 150th anniversary of the incorporation of Anderson as a city was on that date. He was here for that event. Curtis Anderson is his name. He's a third great grandson of Chief Anderson. And he did get to see the wigwam. Outside of Anderson Country Club is this 3D bust of old Chief Anderson. There is a mate to that that used to be above the bar in the Hotel Anderson that used to be uh, on Meridian Street between 7th and 8th Street before your time. But there was a twin to that. They raised the building, but one of our members of the Historical Society got down there before they tore that up, salvaged it, and we have it today in the basement of the museum at the Historical Society. 